Hello, hello. I think this is working. Can everybody hear okay? Got some thumbs up. I love that. Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. It is so nice to see y'all. Uh, I'm Kelly with your Citizens Action Coalition, joined by some of my fabulous co-workers. We've got Kerwin, Ben, and Bryce on the camera. Um, Citizens Action Coalition is a nonprofit consumer and environmental advocacy organization. We are not a state government entity, just wanted to make that clear. Those folks are coming down on the 29th for the field hearing. Um, we are a group that was founded here in Indiana back in 1974 in response to the energy crisis. Um, a number of community organizations felt that the little guy needed representation. And so we're a statewide group. We've grown a bit since then. But we work to keep uh, an eye on the utility companies is our uh, bread and butter. And I appreciate the humor. Yep, yep. <laughs> Um, we are statewide, so we keep an eye on the five big investor-owned electric utilities. There's three big gas utilities and a couple large water utilities as well. They keep us pretty busy, as you can imagine. Um, let's see here. I'm sure this group in particular, since y'all have paid the highest electric bills in Indiana since 2008, can appreciate that it's often an uphill battle this fight for fair and affordable utility rates, but it is so important to keep the faith because persistence does pay off. And we have been able to save Hoosiers about $10 billion in excess utility charges since we were founded. Um, I think this is good, yep, and since we are not a state government entity, again, we are not funded by utility rates or tax dollars, so we just wanted to be clear about that. Um, we are really hoping that today is helpful for the field hearing coming up on the 29th. So that is what is behind the structure of our presentation today. Um, and I'm going to brag on my coworkers here for a minute. Uh, ben Inskeep has been with us for a couple years now, as of March, and we feel really lucky to have him with us. Uh, before he came to CAC, Ben analyzed utility rate cases from across the country. So he really does an amazing job digging through thousands and thousands of pages of testimony that cover a lot of ground to isolate how it's going to affect residential customers, you all. That's really a big focus of our organization. I imagine that it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack sometimes. Is that correct, Ben? <laughs> awesome. So Ben will give us a lot of good information about this case and about the background of regulating utilities as well. Um, also going to give a shout out to our fearless leader, our executive director, Kerwin. Uh, he wears a lot of hats for us here at CAC, but uh, this time of year, when the General Assembly is in session, he's very busy advocating for the little guy at the Indiana State House. Um, as you can imagine, utilities have a presence, right? And so what we do is track legislation to see how it will impact customers, do our darndest to share that information and get legislators to see how it will impact the people. So those are a couple big ways that we advocate for utility customers here in Indiana. And of course, as we touch on um, the rate case itself, a big part of the focus today will also be how you can take action, uh, because that is so important and will be a big focus coming up on the 29th but we will break into a question and answer session after we get done with our presentation. Uh, so feel free at that point, we've got little slips in back if you'd like to fill them out. Uh, if not, I think we'll do a hands up type situation, but please ask all the questions you can think. We're really looking forward to chatting with you. And with that, I will pass it off to Thanks Josh, is this okay if I stand over here? Okay. okay. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see everybody here. You know, since COVID, we haven't done a whole lot of stuff in person, lots of webinars, lots of hybrid stuff, and just decided that it was it was time to get back out into the community. So this is one of the first events we've done. So it's, it's, it's great to see uh, everybody here, but we're also recording this uh, as well. So the recording of it will be, um, will be available. Um, and I'm gonna give a, a little bit of background uh, on the IURC and the State House quickly, although we're primarily here to 
hear about the rate case, which Ben will discuss. But uh, yeah, just quickly with respect to um, utility service in the state of Indiana, just so everybody's well aware, we are a monopoly state. Electric and gas utilities have assigned electrical services territory, um, uh, otherwise known as the Electrical Services Territory Act. Geographical areas actually by statute. So by law we have um, monopolies. And as a result, we have uh, investor-owned utilities who as a result of giving them the privilege, if you will, of a captive customer rate base and exclusive marketplace, they in turn accept regulation by the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission. The primary function, uh, I, I see lots of chuckles, I'm just providing information. <laughs> no opinion yet, anyway. Um, but the IRC is the agency that oversees the investor-owned um, utilities and some of the larger nonprofit utilities. But their primary role is supposed to be a surrogate to competition. When we created these natural monopolies over 100 years ago, we said it makes sense to have natural monopolies for utility service because infrastructure is very expensive. Don't want a lot of duplicative infrastructure. Water pipes running next to water pipes, power lines running next to power lines, gas lines running next to gas line. It makes sense. These are natural monopolies. So in exchange, let's create these regulatory bodies to oversee these and they will be the surrogate to competition. That hasn't worked out as all of us had hoped, but that's the that's the general concept is the IORC is there to serve as competition in the absence thereof. Uh, and what we're talking about today, um, at the IORC, we're talking about the rate case, but just want to provide a little bit of background on the different ways in which utility bills are raised. Utilities bills primarily have three components. They have what's known as your base rates, or the rates that are generally permanent in nature, unless and until the utility files a new rate case. Then there's taxes, and then there's what's known as trackers or riders, which are adjustable billing mechanisms uh, that utilities can raise rates for for specific projects that are temporary in nature. They're narrow, they're related to either fuel costs, RTO costs, costs for transmission, distribution, meters, whatever the case may be. Those rates fluctuate. Those rates change every three months. Some change every six months, some change on an annual basis. Um, but those are very narrow issues, and we've seen a proliferation of trackers in the state of Indiana, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, the procedural schedule, meaning, when we say procedural schedule, what we mean is how long from the time the utility files a petition for a rate increase is that rate increase actually approved by the commission. A rate case takes at least 10 months. Utility company files a petition, in November, you're generally going to see an order from the commission the following September, October, a little less than a year. Tracker proceedings are on a shorter time period, a fast track time proceeding. Sometimes those orders come down very, very quickly from the time in which uh, it's, it's, it's just an order is issued. And again, the rate case deals with those base rates, which are permanent in nature. Those tracker proceedings deal with those very narrow issues that are temporary and fluctuate frequently and do oftentimes go down. So trackers aren't necessarily rate increase, but those are adjustments. Uh, and just quickly um, talk about all of these trackers and one of the reasons that utility regulation in the state has been undermined and utility bills have been what CAC considers skyrocketing, especially uh, over the last 12 or 13 years, is because of what's known as trackers or riders or bill adjustment mechanisms, whatever whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's been an extraordinary amount of really bad legislation passed uh, over the last 12 or 13 years that has insulated utility companies from risk, transferred that risk to customers, and basically we like to call a lot of these stuff blank checks. Uh, I've got, we've got some examples up here. Uh, blank check for grid spending. Two bills that drove that. The first bill was Senate Bill 560 in 2013, followed up by 1470 in 2019. But this is effectively a tracker that allows the utilities to raise rates very quickly, very rapidly, for everybody's probably heard of the TDSIC, Transmission Distribution Storage Improvement Charge. But this is a tracker that the utilities got that allows them to track the cost for transmission, distribution, 
and what's known as storage and meters. Basically everything from the power plant to your meter, utility companies can put in this tracker. And just quickly on that tracker, the commission can create trackers. They don't need to be created by the General Assembly. For years, the utilities tried to get a transmission tracker at the IURC in their rate cases. For years, the commission said no. No, 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 because grid maintenance, upgrades, O&M, that's the cost of doing business. That's the cost of being doing business. We gave these utilities these exclusive state franchise monopolies, recognizing that there's a high cost of capital, but we also gave them what's known as cost plus regulation, where profit is built into rates, and the commission for years said it's appropriate for utility shareholders to fund that operations in between rate cases, come in with a rate case, tell us how much you spend, and we'll decide how much of that you get back. Uh, so as a result of the utility saying, no, 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 or the commission saying no, 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 no for years. They finally went to the General Assembly in 2013, which just happened to also be the first year of uh, a Mike Pence governorship in the state of Indiana. Mike Pence wasn't really paying attention to what the legislature was doing. Governor Daniels said no to this very same bill for years. They found their opportunity. New governor wasn't paying attention, and they got it done, and that's driven up bills extraordinarily in the state of Indiana. We also have blank check for power plants, generally referred to as QUIP, construction work in progress. Folks might have heard QUIP, QUIP before. Uh, QUIP allows utility companies to charge for the construction of power plants while they're being built, before they're delivering any power, and even if they never deliver any power, what's the problem with that? Delivering power, again, is the cost of doing business, the cost of their job. They are shifting the risk and the financing of construction of power plants away from the utility, away from the in voluntary investors, and onto captive customers. And what's the problem with that? Financing these days, these utilities can finance stuff at three and four percent interest rates. You do it through Quip. Guess what? They're getting a ten and a half percent rate of return, a ten percent rate of return. So consumer advocates like to say, you know, we don't like Quip because you know utility customers have nothing better to do with their money than give interest-free loans to monopoly utility companies. So QUIP is another bill uh, that has transferred risk and cost. Uh, and the other bill, and maybe the, maybe the worst of them all, although they're all bad, but Senate Roll Act 251 in 2011. Very contentious bill. We almost beat it, but it barely got across the finish line in the Senate. That was what was known as the Federal Mandate Statute Bill. That bill was a reaction and a response to fear from the Indiana Electric and Gas Utilities over Senator, or President Obama and the Obama EPA and them proposing regulations on coal-fired power plants, gas pipelines, lots of other issues. So rather than, rather than addressing those issues in such a way with alternative methods of complying, whether it's shutting down coal plants, building cheaper renewables, et cetera, et cetera, General Assembly, in their infinite wisdom, passed a law that basically said utilities, any, any mandate from any federal agency, whether it's Department of Energy, the EPA, Congress, DOT, whatever the case may be, any mandate from a federal office that comes down that utilities have to comply with, guess what? Customers have to pay for it. Not shareholders, not the utility. Customers have to pay for it. And that is when we started seeing significant escalations in utility bills across the state of Indiana <clears throat> because utilities started spending billions. We spent over, depending on whose numbers you believe, somewhere between 14 and 17 billion dollars on coal plants in the state of Indiana in the 2010s. Coal plants that we are now retiring because they're too expensive to run they're being beat by cheaper gas, cheaper wind, cheaper solar. Groups like CAC 15, 20 years ago were saying, why are we sinking billions of dollars into coal plants that are gonna be retiring within the next 10 years? And that's exactly what's happening. And so that exacerbated, if not motivated, the affordability crisis we're seeing today because what's happening is customers are paying all of these costs that we spent on coal plants in the 2010s that are now retiring on top of 
the costs that we are paying to replace the capacity, and we're paying for both. We're paying twice. I won't revisit that whole conversation, but um, those are the three big, big tracker bills that impacted us. And, and then I just quickly want to talk about two other laws that we don't like very much, and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Ben to talk about the rate case. But in addition to insulating utility shareholders, investors from risk through these tracker laws, through these tracker bills, driving the high cost, high capital options that lead to more profits for utility companies, what else have they done? So by doing that, well, first of all, those trackers, the main problem with them is they undermine the authority of the regulatory commission. We all want to blame the IURC, be angry with the IURC, but sadly, many of these laws mandate that the IURC approve these projects. They have eliminated the discretion and the flexibility of those regulators to make choices that are based on the evidence presented in the record by mandating things in statute. So, reducing competition by eliminating discretion, flexibility, and authority of the commission. Well, they also got rid of a lot of competition by doing what? Senate Bill 340, 2014, that repealed Energizing Indiana and repealed the Midwest's strongest energy efficiency resource standing, meaning that was directing utility companies to invest a certain amount of money in energy efficiency. And for the first time ever, as the IURC told Summer Study Committee at the General Assembly in 2014 after the bill has passed, that because of Mitch Daniels energy efficiency resource standard and energizing Indiana, for the first time the IORC had seen a reduction, a declining trend in monthly electric bills, and the state utility forecasting group who forecasts electric demand in Indiana for the first time started to see a reduction in the demand needs across the state, meaning less power plants, less transmission, cheaper costs for customers. So what do they do? They kill it. They kill Energizing Indiana, repeal the energy efficiency, energy efficiency resource standard. What was the other threat? To utility revenues and profits, energy efficiency, huge threat to utility revenues and profits. The other threat, rooftop solar. What are we gonna do about this rooftop solar stuff? We all know about Senate Bill 309 and the ending of net metering in Indiana and the killing of net metering in Indiana. We have basically not quite eviscerated the solar market in Indiana, but close. So not only do we reduce competition by removing the flexibility, discretion, authority of the commission and their ability to regulate these monopolies, options that are available to customers to reduce their costs, control their energy costs, we get rid of those. We kill Energizing Indiana, repeal that efficiency resource standards, direct more spending to power plants and transmission instead of insulation, more efficient appliances, that sort of thing. And then, boy, you gotta get rid of that net meter. It reminds me of, anybody remember who killed the electric car? Uh, that old movie. You should go back and watch that sometime because there's a great scene where Robert Goulet is playing an energy executive and they're in a room and he holds up a CFL light bulb and he goes, gentlemen, what are we gonna do about these things? And it's all the oil and electric executives. That's exactly what they did here. What are we gonna do about energy efficiency? What are we gonna do about rooftop solar? I know. We'll just get rid of it. We'll have our paid back handlers at the state house do that for us and that's precisely what we did. But with that, I will turn it over to Ben to uh, more specifically talk about rate cases and uh, what we're dealing here with, with Center Point. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. This on, okay, great. Before I get into the details of this rate case, and I promise we will cover them in detail, let me cover just a couple quick concepts about what is a rate case, what are the things in a rate case that I should be paying attention to and I should know just a little bit about. So real quick, uh, this is wonky, wonky stuff, so I like to use an analogy of ordering a pizza. Say your family, you're hungry, you want to order a pizza. Okay, how big a pizza does your family need? Do you need to get the extra large, the large, the medium? That's kind of like the concept in a rate case of a revenue requirement. How much money does the utility get to recover each year for their operations? Are we ordering them an extra large amount? Center point in this case wants a $119 million increase in their size of their pizza per year, that's not just overall, that's per year, each year getting $119 million more than they were in the past. Who's paying for the pizza? Okay, so you got your friends over. I eat one piece, my friend eats three pieces, 
Should we pay the same amount? Well, I think my friend, he's eating three times as much as I should. I think some of the costs, more of the costs should be allocated to him, okay? That's kind of like the cost allocation piece. After you figure out how big that revenue requirement is, who's paying those costs? Is it gonna be residential customers? Is it gonna be commercial customers? Is it gonna be industrial customers? So that's this part of the rate case, figuring out, okay, how are we gonna divvy up the costs? We're really concerned about making sure residential customers don't get short of the stick and get stuck with too much of the cost. Then the final piece is after you figure out the revenue requirement, how much utility gets in a year. After you figure out the cost allocation, how are we splitting up those costs between different types of utility customers? Then you got the rate design. Okay, how are we gonna actually recover those costs from residential customers? How are we gonna recover those costs from commercial customers? So on. You can do that, uh, and to simplify a little bit, you can do it in fixed charges or variable charges. You can say, okay, if you have pizza, you, everybody pays the same price, fixed charge. Or you can say, well, maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe people that ate more of the pizza that I ordered should pay, should chip in more, right? That's a, that'd be a variable charge. The more pizza you eat, the more you pay, okay? Now let's apply it to Centerpoint in their rate case specifically. A little bit of dark humor to get us going here. <laughs> it often feels like in a rate case, there are a lot of costs that utilities are asking for, and there's a lot of costs in our bills that we're paying for that are not fair and that are not appropriate. That's exactly what this rate case is about. It's about allowing other folks, interveners, folks like Citizens Action Coalition, like the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor, other folks that want to formally intervene in the case, they can look at the utility books, they can ask the utility questions, and the utility has to answer those questions on the record. And then we can file evidence and challenge it if it's not appropriate. I should note, before I dive into the details, this rate case is only about your electric bills, okay? I think a lot of folks probably also have a gas component of their bill. And Centerpoint does combined billing, so you see often see just the total price. Right now, we're talking about increases to that electric portion only through this rate case. Okay, so what happened? Back in December, Centerpoint filed this rate case, the first rate case in over a decade. And in it, they're requesting a very large increase. In fact, disturbingly, it's the largest proposed bill increase for a typical customer that I've ever seen anywhere in the country. I've been studying this for many years. And typically, a utility comes in, they're asking for maybe a $5 raise, $10 raise, $15 raise in the average residential bill. In this case, uh, Centerpoint is asking for a $47 a month raise in a typical Centerpoint electric customer bill. If you're a Centerpoint customer that has electric heating, you're on the electric heating rate, which is a little bit different than the rate everybody else pays. 22% of Centerpoint customers have this electric heating rate. Your bill is going up even more. We're talking about an average of over $63 a month that this rate increase would cost. So we're very, very concerned by the magnitude of this rate increase and how it's gonna impact folks living here in Southwest Indiana. This is what that rate increase looks like on a graph. Right here, this is a bill for a residential customer in the state of Indiana using 1,000 kilowatt hours per month. It's a pretty standard amount, probably a little bit above what a typical average residential customer is using today in Indiana. But it's a pretty good benchmark. And you can see how Centerpoint, how their rates compare to the rates of our other four investor-owned utilities in the state of Indiana. Some, something doesn't look right here, does it, folks? Mm. Not where we've been, and certainly not where we're going. I had to create new levels on this graph to show center point on here because it wouldn't fit otherwise. We're talking over $250 a month for 1,000 kilowatt hours of usage if this rate increase is approved. So massive bill increase. Compared to what you were paying this past summer, July 2023, it would be an $88 per month bill increase. Massive. I do want to note, uh, we will post these slides at the uh, after today on our website. Feel free to take pictures if you want, but we'll also post the full presentation so you all will have all this information when you go home and can reference it. So don't feel like you need to scramble to, to get something, uh, but please feel free to take notes or, or to take pictures. Let's talk a little bit about that rate design talked about. How are they going to collect that money from folks? First component, the fixed charge, your base fixed charge. It's currently $10.84. Not showing on this graph is also a tracker that has a fixed charge component too. So I should know, 
that fixed charge component of your bill is probably closer to maybe about $17 today. But the base charge is $10.84. And they want to more than double that to $23.20. Variable charges are not a prettier picture at all. You see that our current rates are a little bit over 17 cents per kilowatt hour today. What CenterPoint is proposing, it would make it over 22 cents by 2026. These rates would be implemented over three different phases. Phase one would hit uh, at the end of this year, probably around November, um, when the commission issues its order and CenterPoint implements the rates. There would be an additional rate increase uh, at the beginning of 2025. And then the final step, what's reflected here and what's reflected on the previous graphs, would be implemented in the early 2026 timeframe. So this is over just two, two and a half year uh, type of time frame that these rate increases would hit. Now, we can certainly understand that the utility needs to maybe recover its money to be able to operate. But when we look at what are some of the factors driving this rate increase, not all of them seem fair or seem reasonable. One of those is right here. It's CenterPoint currently has the highest authorized profit margin of any of our investor-owned electric utilities in the state of Indiana, as shown on the right-hand side. 10.4%. That's what they are currently authorized to get. That's what they're proposing to keep in the future. You can see that it's much more than our other investor-owned utilities. But you might also know that CenterPoint is now, you know, formerly Vectron. They got bought by CenterPoint. CenterPoint has other utilities across the country, gas and electric. On the left-hand side here, you can see that even compared to other utilities in other states that are owned by CenterPoint, CenterPoint is getting a really sweet deal here, Southwest Indiana, off the backs of customers here, with the highest of any of their subsidiary utilities that they own. We don't think that's fair. This is something utilities, uh, utility regulators have a lot of power to lower in this rate increase. So one of the key aspects of this rate increase is getting them to lower this profit margin that is too high. Now, CenterPoint's CEO has also been making money hand over fist, one of the highest paid executives in the country. I think in uh, 2021, you can see that very high payday their CEO got as a retention package, I think was a large, large part of it, a huge amount of stocks they got. Their CEO has made over $88 million just in the short interval, 2017 to 2022. CEO pay, executive pay, all that is included in your rates. So why should folks be paying, chipping in for this $14 million a year salary for somebody when folks can't even afford their bills today? Again, I think folks can maybe have empathy if the utility was losing money every year. They can say, okay, I can understand you're losing money. You gotta be able to pay the bills. You gotta be able to continue to invest. If you're losing money, maybe we can chip in some more. That's not the case. Center point is making more and more profit every year here from Southwest Indiana electric customers. See their net income measure of profitability has gone up. Back in 2019, after the merger, they were making $58 million a year net income. That's increased to 91 or $90 million the last couple years. So they're doing okay. They wanna raise that net income amount to over $100 million a year in this rate, rate case. So center point profit goes, goes up as part of this rate case. Let's talk a little bit about what are some of the driving factors of this rate case. What are they buying? Why is it you know, hitting our bills? Why is it costing us so much? Well, as Kerwin pointed out, the legislation we have in the state has created the opportunity for utilities to make windfall. It's reduced the opportunity for our regulators to say no and to put their foot down. And you can see that with the investment decisions that CenterPoint has made without adequate regard for their customers and how the customer bills are going to be impacted by those decisions. First up here, you can see the coal plants. We have a lot of costs associated with those coal plants in the form of pollution control equipment to reduce the amount of pollution that are emitted from those plants. You have the cost of all the coal ash that has been piling up and piling up and piling up. Nobody doing anything about it. Sitting in unlined ponds, leaching into our groundwater. No adequate consideration of the long-term health and safety of the communities where these plants are located. So they have to clean those up now. Those costs get hit in our bills. And then you even have costs of coal plants that have already been retired and are not generating electricity 
hundreds of millions of dollars that CenterPoint has not yet collected from customers for those coal plants. They've, they've invested that money, they retired them early, and they want customers to pay those costs. So included in your bills right now, including in your bills going forward, are gonna be costs of power plants that have already retired, that are not serving you with any electricity, that are not providing any reliability, they're still, you're still paying for them. CenterPoint wants to build a new natural gas plant at that A.B. Brown site where the, the coal plants, uh, two units, just retired. That natural gas plant, they've said, is very rarely going to operate. It's only going to be turned on in rare circumstances, yet it costs a huge amount of money. CenterPoint's own math, this isn't my math, there's a CenterPoint in their filing, said $18 a month is what we're estimating that increase for residential customers for this natural gas plant that's barely going to operate. One of the, one of the maybe the most absurd aspects of it is the pipeline cost. They're going to be paying over 20 years to an entity that's building that pipeline for them. That's going to be over $500 million just to use the pipeline. They don't get to own it. That's not for the natural gas that's in the pipeline going to the power plant. That's just for using the pipeline. Half a, mil half a billion dollars. And of course, there's also lots of investments in renewable energy, things like solar power plants they're building that are coming online as well. Doesn't stop there, folks. Lots of spending, Kerwin mentioned. The TDASIC, the transmission, distribution, and storage system investment charge, that legislation has led to huge, huge spending on the grid, on transmission and distribution system. Not just for things like, oh no, this power, or this, this wire fell and we need to replace it, or this pole is really old and we need to replace it, but all sorts of things. Utilities uh, have stuffed in those TDASIC plans and regulators have little authority, little ability to take a fine look at those plans and cut out things that don't make sense. They pretty much have to approve them, yes or no, the whole thing. And CenterPoint's taking full advantage of that. You can see over $900 million in past and future expected spending through 2028 for those TSA plans. And then another element. Let's talk about that cost allocation piece, remember? Even if we we're able to shrink the size of how much they spend. Are residential customers paying their fair share, or are they paying more than their fair share? We think they're paying far more than their fair share, both currently in their bills today, as well as proposed in this rate case, because of this sweetheart deals and special cost allocation for the very, very big industrial customers that use a huge amount of electricity, yet aren't paying their fair share. In fact, industrial customers use more electricity in center points territory than all the residential customers combined. So I think a key part of this case and all cases in front of the commission is making sure residential customers who get their power shut off if they can't afford their bill are not paying for charges that aren't fair to them, that are not paying for things that are subsidizing other people's use of electricity. Perhaps one of the darkest aspects of a rate case is our utilities spend all this money on a rate case itself. They hire some of the most expensive and best lawyers to argue in front of the commission on their behalf. They go out across the country and hire the best experts to help them advocate for higher profit margins or special treatment for various types of rates or depreciation or cost recovery so that you will pay more and their shareholders will get more. But at the end of the day, guess who foots the bill? for those lawyers and those experts. It's y'all. Utility asked for $2.1 million, $2.1 million to file this rate case, to hire these experts and attorneys, to advocate to the commission to raise your rates. That to me is ridiculous. We should not be paying for things like the utilities lawyers who are arguing to raise our rates. The shareholders should cover something like that, right? It seems like common sense to me. And yeah, here we are. Well, let's move along. I, I do want to also mention uh, one final variable or factor in why are rates so high in CenterPoint's territory. I think it is fair to point out that CenterPoint does have fewer electric customers than some of these other investor-owned utilities in the state of Indiana. About 150,000 total customers in CenterPoint's territory. That means when you compare it to a utility like Duke that has more than 800,000 customers, a utility like Duke will have more customers to spread out those costs. So when they 
make an investment, it often means less of an immediate bill impact for folks because they can spread out those costs over more folks. So that is a factor as well. But as you can tell, there's a lot of other factors. It's not just because CenterPoint has fewer customers that bills are higher here. It's also because CenterPoint has not been managing their business in a way that is customer focused. Okay, so that's some of the details of the rate case. And if you have questions about what else is in there, feel free to ask it at the end. I do wanna pivot now to talk about the really important public hearing that's gonna be happening, not this Thursday, the Thursday after that Thursday, okay? So, details are here. Details will be on the last slide of our presentation. Details are also on the handout at the back of the room if you wanna grab a piece of paper as you leave if you didn't get one already. But this is what we're talking about, folks. This is where we really need to show up and turn out because the commission is coming down to Evansville for these hearings. One hearing is gonna be at 2 p.m. on that Thursday, the 29th of February. Four hours later will be the second hearing. You can pick either one. You don't need to come to both, you're welcome to, but you only need to speak at one. Both of those are gonna be treated equally in terms of the commission's gonna be listened to both. It's just two different time periods in case you know, one doesn't work for you very well based on your work schedule or your life schedule. I should point out, this is this kind of what it looked like. This was the AES hearing up in Indianapolis. You can see what it looks like. You're, there's a, usually gonna be a table at the front of the room where the commissioners sit, often on the left side. The judge will be there in the middle. And then there's gonna be some lawyers. There's gonna be a center point lawyer. There's gonna be a lawyer from the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor who's gonna be looking out for all consumers in this case. And Citizens Action Coalition is gonna have our lawyer up there as well, Jennifer Washburn. So know that just because it looks intimidating, doesn't mean everybody up there is trying to grill you. This is just the setup of these type of hearings. So let's talk a little bit more. What is a hearing, why, why is it so important? These are pretty rare opportunities for our commissioners to hear directly from folks like you and me, okay? The last rate case, I think was filed in 2009, was decided in 2011. That's the last time there's been a rate case where we've opened up the books of CenterPoint, where we've had a hearing, where we've had a chance to speak to the commissioners in this capacity. So it's a pretty rare opportunity, and that's why it's really important for a strong turnout of folks like you. It's a great chance for you to share your story. Why is this rate increase ridiculous? Why, is it, why would it hurt you and your family? Why would it make your business struggle to be able to get by? And if not for you, what about your neighbors or others in the community that are vulnerable who maybe have different circumstances than yourself? This is a great chance to show your solidarity with others in your community who could be struggling. One thing I'd like to recommend, if you saw that first photo there of the commission, it's kind of intimidating for anybody to go up and speak to the commissioners, to speak to the lawyers, and it's easy to lose your train of thought or to have something you're thinking about while sitting in the audience. That's why I personally like to write it down. You're allowed to write stuff down, you're allowed to bring notes, you're allowed to write out your comments and just read them if you want. So feel free to do that if you want. You don't have to, but you're welcome to just go there and speak from the heart as well. We do recommend, this is very, it's very frustrating to see such high bills for so long and now to have center point file this egregious of a bill increase proposal. So it's easy to lose your temper. It's easy to be really mad and upset. It's okay to be passionate. It's okay to be speaking from the heart. But we do encourage you to still try to be polite, be concise in your comments. Remember, these commissioners are folks we're trying to win over to our point of view. We don't want to make them defensive. We don't want to make them mad. We don't want them shutting down and not listening to what we have to say. We want to convince them of why this is unreasonable and why we should not approve this rate increase. So just some food for thought. What's the process going to be like when I turn up to the commission for that hearing? Well, first, we recommend arriving a little bit early. The Office of Utility Consumer Counselor will be set up there at a table. You can fill out a little form saying, yes, I want to speak. Make sure you do that. You can change your mind if you decide, you know what, I don't really want to speak after all. You don't have to speak. But make sure you fill out that form. They'll preserve your opportunity too, so they'll call on you when it's your turn, so you have that chance. You go and take your seat. When it's, the hearing starts, the judge will ask you to stand if you want to speak. Everybody's going to stand together. You're going to make an oath saying you're going to tell the truth, because what you say is going to be entered into evidence of the record in this case. You're going to be asked to spell your name, and then you can speak in the microphone and make sure the court reporter can capture your comments because that is really powerful evidence 
in this type of case, is to hear from regular folks who are going to be impacted by what CenterPoint is proposing. That perspective is really valuable and needs to be part of this case. So thank you very much if you do decide to speak. Note, just because you're not gonna see us speaking doesn't mean we're not very much involved in this case and paying attention. This is an opportunity for folks who are CenterPoint Electric customers to speak to the commission. Citizens Action Coalition, we will be involved in the case. We're gonna be filing a written expert testimony. We're gonna be filing legal briefs. We're gonna be heavily involved. So don't want you to feel like we just abandoned it because we didn't hear us or see us at the commission speak. You don't have to speak at the commission, or excuse me, at the public hearing. Uh, you can also just you can also submit written comments. That's also a very fine way to get your perspective into the evidentiary record of this case to have the commission weigh it. So if you can't attend the public hearing, consider submitting written comments. You can use this QR code to go to our quick action page where you don't even need to think about how do I find the right place to submit it and submit it in the right way. We've got it so you can just type it right there, hit submit, and it'll go to the right place at the right time. This is also part of the handout at the back, so if you can't capture it right away, it'll be there. This is uh, also a great opportunity for you to ask your elected officials to come out to the public hearing and to speak on behalf of their constituents. The perspective of elected officials often carries extra weight so it is really important that we have a good turnout from our elected officials at the local level and at the state level in terms of our lawmakers, city councilors, mayor, so on. So please do encourage those folks to also attend and speak out on behalf of their constituents. Tell CenterPoint, this is way too high. Our community cannot bear this rate increase. Please also help us spread the word. I really appreciate y'all coming out here on a Sunday um, to, to hear about this rate case. Um, would love for you to help us continue to spread the word of the community, make sure this public hearing is well attended, bring your friends, bring your family, everybody can come. Uh, even if you don't speak, you can just be there to support everybody else. So know that, uh, you know, sometimes even when you get up to the mic, it feels kind of intimidating. You're not sure if anybody even wants to hear what you have to say up there. Everybody behind you in the audience wants to hear what you have to say. We're all here to support you. We all want to hear what you have to say. Your perspective matters a lot. We also have a web page that has more details. We'll post slides there. We'll keep up folks updated. Um, if you want to register to get emails from us, we'll make sure to send out actions and alerts when developments happen in this case. Excuse me. Okay, I think with that, uh, here are those three different actions you can take with QR code. This is also the handout in the back if you want a physical copy of it. Here's the details of the public hearing to have one more time. With that, we want to hear from you. What are your questions? What are your comments? Happy to hear from you all right now. So raise your hand or fill out the pink slip at the back. All right, let's start at the front and work our way around the room. <coughs> I'm curious why Center Point North is allowed to have rate relief and Center Point South has to bear the rate bear the cost of higher rates. I don't know why that's the case. Um, and when we come to speak, how much time will we be given? In my experience, when you uh, come to a public hearing, the commission does not typically set a time limitation. Um, we do encourage you know to be brief and concise as possible, but you do have the time to, to, to speak to the commissioners, and this is your chance to use it. So. Um, with regard to your first question on the difference between Center Point North, which is a gas utility that serves a lot more customers in, in the northern part of the state compared to Center Point South, that's a, that's a great question. We think the combining those two utilities could maybe potentially help folks in Center Point South by making sure those costs are spread across more customers. So right now that is not a decision that Center Point has decided to make. But that's a that's a great question. Whose choice is it? Yeah, but I would also add Center Point North is strictly a gas, a gas utility. You have you have three separate utilities. You have Center Point North gas utility, Center Point South gas utility, Center Point South electric utility. But but Ben's right. The disparity between 
what Center Point South gas customers pay and what Center Point North gas customers pay is really quite astonishing. Yeah. And the idea that they're raising rates, they're, the idea that customers in their home city of Evansville are paying more than their customers up in Carmel or Fishers or Terre Haute or Brownsburg where I live is, is, is uh, yeah, but this is an electric case. So those Center Point North customers are, are gas only. But they, yeah. but I, again, I mean, they got rate relief, April 2021, right? Am I, am I wrong about that? They got, they got a, they got a, they applied for rate relief and were granted rate relief. Why, why can't that happen here? I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about other than if you're talking about the recent tracker, the gas clause adjustment, the gas costs, those have come down for all gas utilities this year. But I'm not sure specifically what you're referring to. So, okay. I'll take it up. Yeah. And let me, this one does work. I'm gonna start over here and then we'll work over there. Who comprises the IURC? What are their qualifications? And what, if any, revolving door exists between IURC and the industry? <laughs> well, we used to have a long running campaign called the Fox Guarding the Hen House, if you will. But I can tell you, first of all, that the state of Indiana, number one, is one of only three states, one of only three states in the country where those that regulate the investor-owned utilities are not either directly elected by the public or confirmed by one or both chambers of the General Assembly. New Hampshire, Indiana, Nevada, the regulators serve at the will and pleasure of the governor. The commissioners are selected by what's known as the IURC nominating committee. The nominating committee is comprised of one member from the Senate Democrat caucus, one member from the Senate Republican caucus, one member from the House Democratic Caucus, one member from the House Republican Caucus, and three appointees from the governor. So you effectively have, depending on which party's in control, five people on that committee from one political party, two people on that committee from the other political party. And the only requirements in statute are that no more than three of the commissioners are from the same political party as the governor. And the only qualification in statute, per se, is one of the five commissioners have to be a lawyer. That's it. So that's all the law says about who the commissioners are and who they have to be. I personally like, would like to see a diversity of thought, if you will, on the commission. I'm not sure that we want to prescribe, per se, what qualifications you need to be a commissioner. We, because they have a lot of expertise and staff. They have analysts, they have engineers, they have accountants, they have other folks. And so we like to see a mix of, of, of folks on the commission, but generally it's either ex-legislators, ex-connected politicos from the administration or utility folks. Yeah. I noticed when uh, Center Point took over, they started replacing substations and running a lot more high tension wires over and everything. And I thought, well, maybe they're getting ready to hook up a lot of electric vehicles to this grid. And what I'm wondering is if we're going to be paying, instead of gasoline, for electricity at residential customer rates, and whether people in your organization are keeping track of all the cost of the new transformers and adding it all up and seeing what kind of a cost ratio there's going to be when a lot of vehicles are hooked up. Well, I know you probably have a response to this as well, but I would start with a high level response in, in the sense of, well, as far as spending per customer, the utilities all do have what's called these performance metric reports that they have to file at the commission every year that does show capital spending per customer 
you know, on an annual basis. So, so that is tracked. But you're right. Center Point was replacing a lot of substations. Center Point was replacing all the meters. Center Point was replacing a lot of poles and a lot of wires. And why were they doing that? Well, our perspective is that DSIC law. We were talking about trackers. Let's not lose sight of the fact that these are regulated monopolies who have a primary fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to deliver them earnings. How do utility companies in a cost plus regulated state like Indiana make money? By spending money. The more the utilities spend, the more utilities make. Plain and simple. That's just a fact. The more they spend in capital, the more money they make. So they will choose, almost without fail, the most expensive option. So why for years, as I mentioned, did the Utility Commission say no to transmission trackers? Because it's inappropriate. It's the cost of doing business. It's the cost of delivering service. And if you, if you have that risk on investors and on the company, they're going to be far more frugal with their spending. They're going to replace what they need to replace when they need to replace it. You pass a law that gives them a blank check. Guess what? Every meter needs replaced. Every pole needs replaced. Every wire needs replaced. Every substation needs replaced. Not because it needs replaced, but because they want to spend money. They want to spend capital, concrete and steel in the ground. They make 10% on and they want to spend as much money as possible. And when you have a company like Centerpoint that came in here, they like to say merged. They bought Vectrin. They bought Vectrin, and you've seen a significant upkeep, upkeep in income. And the reality is that you folks and the customers of Centerpoint Energy, headquartered in Houston, Texas, that Evansville, Indiana, is nothing but a cash cow. Nothing but a cash cow for those investors in Houston. And that's why you've seen this escalation in capital spending. That's why you've seen this escalation in net income. Because they are making decisions based on a quarterly basis, based on dividends and earnings and their responsibility to the shareholders and executive compensation. And they are not making decisions, we believe, that are in the best interest of the community. And you're giving them a blank check. And you're giving them a blank check to an industry that is notoriously profligate with capital because the more capital they spend, the more money that they make, and all the money they're collecting is coming out of your pockets. I don't know if you want to talk about the EV aspect of it. I went on a different tangent there, but uh, that's what it is. Thank you. I just wonder, uh, okay, what this gentleman just said earlier is uh, that, you know, he was talking about moving to Henderson. I work in Kentucky, I have family in Kentucky, and I also had a business here in Evansville, and then there was the orchards that we worked with in Kentucky and outside of this area. And the difference in what we had to spend on electric bills has goes way, way, way back. Um, what I wanna know, I wanna talk coming up, and I, you know, you, you asked about how long, and you know you can lose people real quick, and I have a really bad problem with that. Um, what is what do you think my best bet is to try to speak because i'm hostage here i'm living on my family's homestead i can't it, sorry but on top of that our solar that we put on the barn you know that they're i thought we finally went up to nine cents and then chris kind of burst in my bubble <laughs> it's gonna chris go will do that chris will do that <laughs> But I mean, I have went through extremes to try to bring our rates where I can afford to live there. I'd rather pay so for my solar panels. You know, they, they argue that it's the rich that's doing it. I'm just doing it to survive, to keep my family's homestead. So I don't know what to say. Well, I'll just quit. I've been a lot of fuel here into my 20 years. And uh, understand where you're coming from. And that's the sort of passion and emotion and feelings that the commission needs to see. We have, seen, we have seen very successful field hearings where customers have talked about real world experience, real world struggles. We've seen hearings, never get one in South Bend or one in Fort Wayne where seniors on Social Security fixed income went up with their monthly budgets. 
So this is my monthly budget. Right now I have $33 left at the end of my monthly budget. Where is this going to come from? The, the heartbreaking guy in Fort Wayne that started crying at the podium because his, his, his wife is ill and he talks about every month I have to decide am I picking up her prescription or am I paying my Indiana Michigan power bill? Um, so I think what Ben was trying to say is emotions, stories, feelings are good. It's, it's the anger, it's the finger pointing, it's the screaming that is not necessarily effective. You don't want to make them defensive, feel attacked, but you want to move them. And we've seen hearings where we moved people. We had a fantastic field hearing in the Indiana American Water Rate case in Gary, where um, big crowd, lots of folks telling stories, but, and you were there if I get this wrong, but a lot of folks, what were they talking about? They were talking about ROEs and profits and executive compensation. And the order just came out in the Indian American Water Rate case, and the commission dinged them significantly on their rate of return and their profit margins. So the other aspect to think about when you're talking to commissioners about rate cases, do your best to give the commission, request things from the commission that they can do for you. They can't change the law. They can't change the rules necessarily, but they can issue things in their orders that will matter materially in the context of what the end result will be on your bill. <clears throat> and we're seeing more and more, I, I, I always hesitate to compliment the commission. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is this, the reality is this. Indiana utility rate payers are facing an affordability crisis we believe that, we know that, we see that in the numbers. Folks are struggling to get by. We're seeing better turnout at, at field hearings, more people telling their stories. We're seeing a little more empathy from the commission, and we're starting to see some of that being reflected in these orders. So the more you can speak to something that the commission can do, reducing the ROE, rejecting rate case expense, rejecting lobbying expense, and anything that they can actually act on, is, is important. And then also telling your story. That story would move them. That story would, 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 would help the cause. As difficult as it is, and I'm sorry. Love you, Connie. We do indeed. And I would like to say real quick, to go back to our presentation, the commissioners hear so much from the utility companies. They hear from the industrial customers who hire their own lawyers. So I, you know, if you are someone who is compelled by the numbers that we throw out and those things say that, but it is totally valid for them to hear what you're going through and it is so important for them to hear it too. Okay. Yeah, amen to that, Kelly, because when utilities file for a rate increase, one of the things they say in their, in their petitions is, these rates are confiscatory for us. Because we have a, and they're saying that because they have that fiduciary responsibility to their investors. These rates, we're not collecting enough money. These rates are, con these rates are confiscatory to you guys and to the ratepayers, not those voluntary investors, so. Ben, did you talk about the, cap the you know, one of the things that was capitalized on cloud computing and some third party cloud computing, their base rates, as well as the revised depreciation rates. Can you speak to any of that so we can have some ideas? Yeah, thank you for the question. <clears throat> so, as part of this case, the center point is requesting to capitalize or to be able to earn a profit on their cloud computing costs. Typically, these are costs that are treated as expenses, as in they just pass through the cost to customers whenever, you know, it's $100 million, customers pay $100 million. If it's $10 million, customers pay $10 million. This proposal would allow them to earn a profit on whatever they spend. So instead of them spending $10 million and charging you $10 million, it's them spending $10 million and charging you $11 million or you know, so on. So they would like to be able to earn a profit on those types of expenses. On the depreciation, I apologize, I do not have that off the top of my head, but we are continuing to look into these uh, issues right now, diving into those details 
Um, and that's definitely going to be a consideration in our testimony. Thank you for the question, though. Hi, uh, so I'm, this is my first political thing I've ever done in my life, okay? This is, uh, woo! This is my good <laughs> You know. And I'm just livid. I moved here, right? I'm on disability. I live in pain all the time, blah, blah, blah. So what I need from you, because I'm pissed, and... Uh, Holding my temper is not something I like to do. They should be ashamed of themselves, every single one of them. And I don't want to dance on your frickin' ego. That's who I am. And I know that that won't help. So what I need from you uh, is a list of those specific things. I don't want to pay for your rate case expense. I don't want to pay for your investor and executive loan. If you could treat me as a kindergartner, and on your site, or I'll give you my email, and write a list so that I have something concrete like that. All of us can say these things, and then I can say shame on you as well. Yeah, that's, that's actually what we can do. We can, we can put together something, yeah. Okay. So, I have a question. If you've already said something, can you still speak at the thing? Yes. Have you spent, spent two or three things? Yes. Send two more and also speak. <laughs> I got a question. I was wanting to know, though, like, is there anything what else? Like, you know, it seems like it says a monopoly, but is there any way if they can bring anybody else in? Because it seems like if they do bring a competitor in, maybe they'll make them act a little decent towards the people of Evansville, because that, that is ridiculous, you know, to keep letting them do the things that they keep doing, you know. But if they bring in competition in, you know, it seems like that'll balance out the playing field a little bit more, you know, make them maybe play a little fair with us, you know, because it's, it's hard, you know. Like, a couple years ago, I was homeless, you know. I ain't homeless no more by the grace of God, but I was homeless on the street because I got a $1,500 bill. I was on the news, I was the one where he said, uh, it said you gotta choose either the medicine, people have to choose medicine or groceries or pay their electric bill, you know, that's real. You know, and also, you know, in our city, we got a lot of gun violence going on, a lot of violence, and a lot of that violence, it trickles from the top. It starts from the people at the top, and it trickles all the way down to the bottom. The more they keep doing that, the more they're gonna hurt our community by taking from our community, not just from our elders, but also from our babies as well. And then, you know, that's, 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 that's what I wanted to say. Like that's what I wanted to say. Well, I, I would start by, at a very high level, we're not here to talk about deregulation, if you will. Um, deregulation is not necessarily the answer from a consumer advocate's perspective. We agree that we need competition. But the experience with deregulated states versus non-deregulated states and ultimate cost to customers, basically showing actually low-income customers are actually paying more in restructured states or states where they have choice. We agree that we need to find ways to inject competition into an uncompetitive marketplace. So certainly understand that feeling and that desire that if I only had a choice, but even if you had a choice, you would still be paying center point to deliver all that energy and all that gas to your home. So you would still be a center point customer per se, just buying your energy from somebody else. So, but that's a, that's a, long, con that's a long conversation. That's why when we say, we are reducing competition by tying the hands of regulators. We're reducing competition by eliminating customer choices through energy efficiency programs, through net metering. Uh, but there's other also, there's a nexus between energy and everything with respect to poverty and affordable housing and the implications that that has in ways in which to use utility bills, utility rates to improve people's lives and lift people up and we're doing the we're doing the exact opposite in Indiana. We're just allowing utility companies to raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. No creative thought, no creative thinking, and no way to... We're, all, we're using ratepayers' economic development tools, is what we're doing. We're seeing a lot of ratepayers throughout the state being used uh, as economic development tools for large economic development projects on the backs of ratepayers. Why? Because politicians get to beat their chest about all these projects they're doing without raising taxes. So let's shift a lot of these costs 
on utility bills. And so our, our structure, our, 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 our utility bills are subsidizing similar to the LEAP project, for example, similar to the industrial rates that, that Ben is talking about. A lot of these projects are in the name of economic development. Well, that's a top-down economic development pro uh, proposal versus using utility rates in such a way in a top-up approach, a grassroots approach by putting more money back in the pockets of working people that they can spend to improve their lives and improve their economy instead of sending it to center point. That was a really strange answer to your question, but if we get the deregulation question or not, we have historically opposed restructuring competition and deregulation because it's not the panacea that people necessarily think it is. One of the issues between Henderson and Evansville, don't get me wrong, I'm not an expert on Kentucky utilities, but I believe Henderson's a municipal utility, a municipal nonprofit utility, which varies, differs entirely from investor-owned utilities like Centerpoint, Louisville Gas and Electric, and other utilities that operate in Kentucky. So I caution comparing the two, but I will tell you in Indiana, forming, uh, this has come up in Evansville a lot over the last 15, 20 years, forming a new municipal utility in the state of Indiana is illegal. Oh, you, can't, you, you can't do it. You can do it if you change the law. You, the, the law would need to be changed in order for Evansville, Indiana to form its own nonprofit municipal electric utility. Some places have done it, looking at Boulder, Colorado, if you want to read that story about how a city pushed back and municipalized their electric utility. But I just get that off the table with the fact of that would be great to have publicly owned nonprofit municipal electric utilities with rates that would probably be more than less than half of what you're paying with Center Point. But you can't do it unless the law was changed. So yeah. Like my daughter, she's what is, is it energy down there? Yeah. Okay. She's on energy. She's not. She's down in Calvin. Her highest bill during those summer and the winters, $150 on a three-bedroom home and with three kids. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, you know that was even before they uh, upgraded the house and added new appliances and stuff. Their electric bills that low. Their water bills are. I mean, it's just amazing the difference by going across the bridge. I laugh, I tell everybody, in fact, one of the things I said in a speech, everybody's going to go across the money-saving bridge. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then work in Indiana because the, who's going to be, I mean, industrial people, that's just it. Indiana is so focused on Toyotas and AstraZeneca and all these other huge manufacturing plants who have the money to compensate. By politicians. Yeah. yeah no, it's it's a, it's a top-down economic approach, and setting utility rates is, as much as people would like to say it's science, it is art. Setting utility rates is art because public policy, public interest has to be incorporated into setting of utility rates. For example, we give many municipalities a discount on their street lights. Why? Street lighting is a public good in terms of public safety, the public interest, so generally, you know, COC is okay with subsidizing public street lights to a certain extent. Gets a little out of control in some of the bigger cities. <laughs> but generally, I mean, that, that's an example of, you know, using utility rates, public transit in places like Northwest Indiana with the South Shore. They get a sort of a special deal from NIPSCO. They get lower rates, but it's the, in the name of helping provide that public service and that public good and robust public transportation um, to the region and we but but instead of but you talk about using utility bills for assistance for low income fixed income vulnerable households suddenly they label it socialism and they reject it you talk about the beauty of energy efficiency the beauty of rooftop and local solar is not only are we reducing the costs to low income households if you do it right 25, 30, 35, 40 percent. Guess what else we're doing? We're creating local jobs in local communities that can't be outsourced, that will never go away, 
and we can continue work training, job training, and so CAC strongly supports the idea of providing assistance to low-income and rural households that can't afford their bill. That's a public good. It's outrageous that many folks are paying 20, 25, 30, 35 percent, if not more, of their income on energy bills, utility bills. We're talking about essential human services necessary for life to live, people to live life in dignity and participate in society in a meaningful way. People should not be paying exorbitant amounts to what are essential human services. But the same thing with rooftop solar energy efficiency. That's reinvesting in the community, improving people's lives, giving people's jobs, putting people, putting money in the pockets of working middle class folks who will then guess what? Spend that money in the economy again, creating growth at the local level. That's a top up, that's a top bottom up approach that we just don't do in the state of Indiana. We do very much a top down approach, regressive taxation, regressive utility rate making, and it's causing an affordability crisis that at some point is going to amount to significant, significant public outcry. And be careful what you wish for, Indiana General Assembly, Governor of Indiana, Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, because it's reaching a breaking point. And with apologies, it's, it's, it's Evansville is becoming sort of the center of that, that discussion, and it breaks our heart. We were shocked. We were shocked when we saw the center point rate increase. Going, how can they possibly expect the arrogance and the hubris? How can they possibly expect people to absorb that kind of cost increase on their monthly bill, understanding how the math just doesn't pencil out in a community that is experiencing over 30% poverty, stagnant wages, minimal investment. Well, guess what, Centerpoint? We gave you a franchise monopoly to serve the community of Evansville and be a good corporate partner. You should be investing in this community, lifting people up, not dragging the income away from our county, sending it down to Houston, Texas, and Wall Street, invest it right here in Evansville, use Centerpoint ratepayers in the public interest, not to just enrich your shareholders. You guys all get that, but that's what's going on here. We were shocked and stunned to see this rate case, and that's why we're here today. So thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Not cutting it off. Yeah. We'll have, uh, we're doing our best. I'm doing my best with this microphone. The reason we want folks to speak into a mic is because our Bryce is recording this. So Hi, other <laughs> folks can watch it and learn from it online. So I will get to everyone, we promise. Um, I had a point. Oh, CAC is 50 this year. And I just, oh, here we go. We will take that. So it does, it takes sort of a lot to shock us because we've been fighting for Hoosiers for 50 years. So I just wanted to emphasize that point. Um, I'm a local AARP volunteer, and AARP's big issue is um, sustainability, being able to age in place. And guys, in 10 years, and I don't know if Centerpoint knows this or not, but there's going to be more people over the age of 65 than there is going to be under the age of 18. So our economy has the possibility of going down. My real uh, question though, we are gonna have people show up for the meeting um, next week. If we're writing a letter, is there a deadline that needs to be placed on when we send the letter in to the board? I would say the deadline is generally set by the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor. They, I'm not speaking for the OECC, <laughs> but the OECC likes to have all public comments uh, into them prior to them submitting their testimony so that they can consider the public comments when forming their testimony. So they will say, it might even say on the OECC website. It does. Yeah, might, they are, might already have a comment deadline date. That said, that said, CAC always gets a little cranky about comment deadlines because this is a pending rate case that's gonna go on for a year. You know, and if you forgot to submit something, you should submit something whenever. And those comments will get to the commission um, one way or another. So I would do your best to get comments in by 
whatever comment deadline that they have. But you can submit comments late, and those will still, you know, eventually get put into the record. So March twelfth. We have any questions on this? Hi there. I just wanted to know, um, is it all or nothing, like for the rate increase, is it going to go all the way to the full amount or can the IURC come back with like a middle point? Um, what, what, how does that work? IURC would push back on what I'm about to say, but the IURC is fully empowered to do whatever they want to do. IURC can do whatever they want to do. And IURC can We've had several rate cases recently. We've seen a decrease in rates. Um, so yes, they can adjust. They can adjust things up, heaven forbid, uh, or 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 down. And they can do things like, oh, you guys want a ten point four ROE? No, we don't think so. You're going to get a nine point three ROE. Well, there you shaved twenty thirty million dollars off the annual revenue requirement. You want this for depreciation? No, we don't think so. So there's a lot that goes into rate case. Uh, and we know all too well that utility companies ask for far more than they really need and far more than they really want. Um, we've just never seen anything quite like this. <laughs> so we're not sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on, uh, well, one statement before I ask a question, please. Uh, the push for profits on uh, Center Point's board being having two representatives from a hedge fund uh, from BlackRock Vanguard uh, should be a concern and an explanation for the push for profits, the most aggressive investors that there are. Uh, the, my question is, I look at the service areas that wind through the state and they go through counties and on the, on the CAC uh, uh, website, your your uh, representation of those service areas shows them cutting through the counties, but it doesn't show towns and cities. And I wondered, uh, do do those lines bisect any towns or cities? And and the reason I ask that is because of the real estate. Uh, we already have people in the Evansville area uh, promoting their real estate sale is not in in center points territory and the disparity in those prices could tear uh, communities apart making them virtual uh, dead zone on one side of the city or the town and on the other side could be the the man in the high castle uh, so i just wondered about it thank you um there are very few uh, we the cities and towns could be served by any number of utilities. So just saying, for example, I live in Brownsburg, Indiana. I am, a, I am served by Hendricks Power. Most people in Brownsburg for electric are served by Duke Energy. But AES has some customers in Brownsburg that creep over across Raceway Road, and then some with Brownsburg addresses have the Pittsburgh Municipal Electric, which I wish I had, because they're the cheapest rates in the state. So I'm about a mile away from there. Maybe I can set up my own wire and connect to their system. I'm not sure. Um, so just in Brownsburg, we have four different electric utilities that could serve you if you have a Brownsburg address. And the same is true. I've lived in Bloomington before. One part of Bloomington I lived in, I was a Duke Energy customer. Another part of Bloomington I lived in, I was a South Central RAMC customer. So the only way to find out precisely a location is you having the zip plus five, uh, zip plus four, and sort of narrowing it down. There was a customer once spoke at State House well, years ago. He lived in Marshall County. He was a Marshall County REFC customer who at the time was the highest utilities rates in the state. One corner, the other corner was an Expo Electric customer. The other corner was an Indiana Michigan Power Electric customer. And the other corner was customer where that REFC was. So he made a nice presentation just about Marshall County RMC areas used to be even higher than set point, they might still be. They're no longer regulated, so we don't know. But he was just pointing out how I pay this. You know, Joe over here on this corner pays this. Phil over here on that corner, you know, 
so on and so forth. So the town or the city doesn't necessarily indicate who the utility is. It's, it's a good signal, and that's not necessarily. Did that answer that question? <laughs> I don't know. Not really, but you know as much about it I have a couple of questions and then maybe a comment too. First of all, um, on this uh, handout, uh, the QR code that says uh, urges us to contact our public officials, what public officials are going to be notified? Kelly, okay, you're a lawyer working on that, so. Uh, no, so this is in part, and I think I'm going to take a step out here and say that Evansville City Council has done something pretty awesome, and that is file the City Council. Two, two, thank you. Hire a lawyer for this case. So what we have this set up to do is to go to the Evansville City Council because we wanted to say thank you. It is awesome to have more lawyers in the case. It's also going to go to Vanderburg and Warwick County commissioners and counselors, as well as the mayor of Evansville. I'm glad to hear that because I was going to um, email all of the city counselors. <laughs> um, then another question is, have any of the uh, charitable nonprofits in our Center Point area uh, contacted you to be involved in speaking or uh, advocating for their uh, clients or neighbors? I mean, no, nobody's called us directly. We have a large network of human services folks around the state that we communicate with, but actually that's something we should probably ask everybody here to do as well. Another thing that's impactful at field hearings is when local food banks, service providers, social services, trustees show up and, and speak on behalf. Because I remember, I can't remember the group, uh, but it was a local four relief agency in South Bend that showed up at the, it was an IM electric hearing in South Bend, and they testified that almost 100% of the poor relief that they provided was to help households with their NIFCO gas bills and their IM electric bills. And this is a poor relief agency at a church that really wants to feed people, clothe people, provide support to working families for school expenses, uh, that sort of thing. And he was like, Almost all the poor relief we get, we send directly to either NIFCO or IM for utility bills. So, local service providers, nonprofits, um, it's great to have those folks show up. Uh, every now and then, one will show up though and go, "We love Centerpoint, get it right, get it right," and that's because they get you know a grant from Centerpoint on an annual basis or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm a volunteer. Uh, for a local uh, charitable nonprofit. And over the last three years, um, our requests have continually increased. We probably every week get an average of 20 requests for assistance. Uh, and I would say roughly 50% or more uh, are for help with center point bills. Uh, the next largest area is rent assistance. Um, and we have a lot of people who contribute to us, but you know, there is an end um, to what we can do. And there are a lot of people we can't help. Sometimes uh, if we get a grant or what, what not, we're able to help with maybe $200 towards a bill. A lot of our people are calling with uh, bills that are multiple hundred dollars and sometimes two and three thousand dollars and the electricity is already turned off. Um, 
there are some months where we can only help with 75 or a hundred dollars and then we um, work with other nonprofits uh, to try and get to coordinate and they're in the same boat and I just heard recently at a meeting I attended yesterday that CAPE is no longer taking applications <coughs> uh, so there there is an end in sight in terms of the help that people can get. Um, and I know from contacts with Centerpoint uh, customer services that there is a, uh, what they call an emergency fund that Centerpoint will tap into from time to time, uh, but it's not enough. And like I have a case right now of a, a disabled gentleman and his 65-year-old father who have um, a $2,900 center point bill and their electricity is cut off. I talked with someone at center point about help with that through their emergency fund. I was told that um, they could help, most likely, but the person had to get back to me. I've made four follow-up calls, and I've made, I've sent one email, and I've had no response since last Thursday. These are the kinds of situations that we're dealing with. Yep, no, appreciate that, and these are the types of stories and situations that drive CAC's work, these are the type of stories we share all the time because we we firmly believe, well, that when you talk about bills, all of the funding we have in Indiana is for crisis funding, and it's never enough. We never look at the affordability side of things, and a policy that CAC has advocated for for a very long time is what's known as a percentage of income payment plan which is what Ohio has, which is what Illinois has, and, and some other jurisdictions that effectively say, for your electric bills, for your gas bills, you will pay no more than 6% of your income, 8% of your income, 4% of your income, whatever the place, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that standard may be. Um, and looking at that service in, in, as, a, as a percentage of income, you know, and so we have to do something to address it's nice to have crisis money to try to help people, but even when you try to help people, the crisis money is gone light heap right now, underfunded by $2 billion. There's $2 billion less, as Congress does absolutely nothing. There's stories like this right now across the country. Uh, Kate's not taking applications because they're out of money. There's no federal money, $2 billion less than what they had uh, two years ago across the country. So these are the issues that that we need to address. And Centerpoint can help that person by, you know what, writing off their balance and turning their power back on. You know? Hi. This lady was awesome in what she said, and my question goes to that as well. I can still pay my bills, but I've been volunteering in Vanderburg County in the homes of people since 2009. Can I tell their stories? Or does it just have to be mine at the field meeting? Please do, yes. Thank you. Thank you again. We're here in the center of the city, and uh, even on a day like this, the reality is that heat islands uh, are present. Uh, there is a present, you know, current, continues to be the reality of environmental injustice and environmental racism and climate injustice. And yet, when we look at uh, the, the rate hikes, there is, a tendency to scapegoat climate action as being responsible for the rate hikes. How can we effectively speak to that? I might get the mark to you in a minute, Ben, but the, the one thing I tell people that want to claim climate activism on rate hikes is look at the mixture of our electricity. There are people at the State House who don't believe in climate science who want to blame renewable energy 
for rate shock in Indiana, and yet we are <laughs> less than 2% solar, less than 8% wind. And so please show me how utility spending on clean energy has exacerbated the utility affordability crisis. What has exacerbated the affordability crisis in the state of Indiana has been all this legislation giving utility companies a blank check. And sorry for those that are proponents of coal, unbelievable, incredible capital spending on coal plants over the last 15 years that we all knew were gonna retire um, because of economics and outdated technology. So that's what drove, my response to those folks is, Show me, show me where solar and wind and climate activity has increased utility bills in the state of Indiana. Because that's one of those things where you're trying to push back and argue against something that's just not true. And so you just have to tilt your head for a minute and go, do you have any evidence to, when their evidence is they saw it on Nextdoor or Facebook or YouTube or something by somebody sitting in their kitchen talking in a microphone. You know, so, but I, the numbers are there. We know we have very little solar, very little wind. Investments in efficiency are paltry in the state of Indiana. And that's not where these rate increases have come from. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, why has Center Point's bills been the highest in the state since 2008? You know, back in 2008, they didn't have solar or wind or anything else. So, don't have much to add other than that graph I showed you that showed Center Point's had the highest bills since 2008. It's long before they began this transition to different types of energy sources. And one last thing, spending on mitigating climate change actually will bring rates down and improve people's quality of life. That's exactly what they don't want to do. I, I'd just like to point out that there is a sales tax on all the bills that we receive. So that I'm asking, what incentive do our state officials have to do anything about the rate increases? Well, I see them on camera here in quite a few places, so I need to be careful. <laughs> um, and I know there's also elected officials in the audience, but generally, my speed, the utilities, you know, generally own the state house, they generally own the congressional delegations, and they have a lots of influence in their local communities as well. But I think people, it'll be the same answer. It's, it's, it's telling your stories. And elected officials, not all, forgive me for the elected officials in the audience, but elected officials, only, only many elected officials, I was about to say all, <laughs> many elected officials only care if they feel like their job is on the line. If they feel vulnerable, if they feel vulnerable, then, then they'll, they'll start to care. So it's the old adage of, you know, vote them out of office, of course, you know, two thirds of the races in Indiana, they don't have any opponents, so you can't really vote them out of office. But it's, it's, it's showing up. It's, it, I know it can be exhaustive, it can be frustrating, but it's going to, I know Chris and all those folks, organizing folks to go to meet your legislative town halls, showing up at field areas when the IORC shows up going to city council meetings, giving that guy a hard time. <laughs> but it's just showing up and continuing to deliver that message of, this is harming me and my family, what can we do about it? And even if they don't have any actual, you know, control or ability to change things, we're seeing things in other communities where city counties are passing resolutions and ordinances against certain projects, ask folks to continue to do that. Indianapolis City Council did that on IPL quite a bit, and that brought some pressure on them to make some changes. So just continue to talk to folks, you know. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. Um, I wonder if at this uh, meeting a week on Thursday that we don't need a, a redefinition and a reuse of language. Um, you know, the euphemism that we are customers um, is it seems to me to be inappropriate. We're, we're more like prisoners. Um, you know, you know we're, we're prisoners in our own homes. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these, um, 
legislated municipal utilities go back to an act of Congress from about 1918, which enabled them to be created and structured um, across the country. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that this is only the second time I've ever come to something like this, and I think the reason is that I came to the hearing with the local politicians on SB 309, the solar power thing, and every single one of them lied to right at our faces about, oh yeah, we're considering this, oh yeah, we're really listening to you guys, when in fact the utilities had already bought them off. They were already bought and paid for. And so my question is, and you've drawn a distinction between how politicians and how the IURC maybe is a bit more independent from that, I don't believe you. I want to know who those people are and have they already been bought off and actually are they going to listen to what we say? I agree with you. I mean, I, I agree. That's, I think your point about prisoners is correct. I think that's why, well, that is why CAC says captive customers, captive consumers. We don't like just saying customers necessarily. Um, you can find out who the commissioners are, if that's what your question is, who the IURC commissioners are. Their biographies are... <coughs> that wasn't my question. Have they already been bought off? Have they already been bought off? Yeah. There is no question in CAC's mind when you have folks that work at the will and pleasure of the governor um, that they are going to make decisions that have to be okay with the governor. Have they already been bought off? Um, depends on how you define bought off. Um, but sure, CAC has, I mean, look at the Edwards Sports scandal. You know, because of the work CAC did, we got the, you know, the chairman of the commission fired in charge of felony counts. So CAC continues to look at the regulatory process, the transparency process, and who these folks are, sure. And yes, we have, we believe there are questionable relationships between the IORC, the commissioners, and the utilities. There's no doubt in our mind. But at the same time, we can work. We can work to resist, reimagine, and reform. At the same time, we are working within the system to try to improve people's lives today. We can do both. We can do both. And what we're saying about that hearing is, this is your opportunity to talk to those who are the decision makers about this rape case. These are the folks that can make decisions related to that bill, and that's what related to this filing. Is the whole system corrupt? Yes. Yes, the whole thing stinks. The whole thing stinks. But that doesn't change the fact that we have people today and a community today that's struggling, that's hurting, and a company that wants to bring them additional harm. And this is your opportunity to talk to the folks that can do something about it in the here and now. We can do that at the same time we say what? The whole system stinks and we need to reform, but at the same time, we've got real world problems today and CAC is gonna to work to do both. And so that's, that's the importance of this hearing, that's the importance of speaking to that body today because these are the folks that can help you now. Thank you. Ben, um, you mentioned in your presentation that the books will be open during this rape case. Are they open during tracker cases as well? Or are portions of the books open for tracker? So if their entire books are going to be open, I, I was thinking about your cartoon that you started with. When are they open? Will it become public knowledge, or is it just to the uh, interveners? Uh, will we be able to see how much they spend on lobbying, on advertising, on other things that aren't really providing a service to their uh, prisoners? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Thank you very much. The answer is, Yes, uh, to an extent. As part of the rate case, they do file a lot of exhibits, a lot of Excel spreadsheets showing all the details of where the costs are coming from. Here's our forecast of the future and why we're thinking we need more money to pay for those future costs. 
there's some confidential information that's maybe sensitive information that only interveners that sign a non-disclosure agreement can access, review, make sure there's, you know, everything's uh, up to code, if you will. Uh, so, yes, in the formal Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission docket, they do put a lot of information there. There's 20 different witnesses they have that filed written testimony. There's all these spreadsheets and exhibits and attachments that provide additional financial details. Part of the rate case process is that interveners go through this stuff with a fine tooth comb, trying to identify those things, trying to make sure center point's not including things in rates that are inappropriate. And when things don't make sense, we can ask formal discovery questions that the utility has to respond to, has to be truthful to. So this is an opportunity to check those things and make sure, and if we find things like yeah, lobbying or other inappropriate costs, we call them out and we say, you gotta reject this. But the general public will have that information without going into that. The, the general public can access these documents. They are posted online publicly. Um, the vast majority of them are. Um, it's just thousands of pages, many spreadsheets, so it's, it's not simple. <laughs> but for folks who are curious, who want more details, who want to do more sleuthing, it is there. And then uh, in the testimony that is filed by interveners, like the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor, the CAC, we also file our own, what we've discovered through careful review. So that is part of that process. I don't have a warm, fuzzy feeling about the Indiana Regulatory Commission when I realize if you look at their resumes, over half of them are former utility company employees. It's a revolving door. They're, they get on the Regulatory Commission from a utility company, and as soon as their term is up, they go back to their old job with the utility company. So basically, that's what we're up against. We're, we're very concerned by things like, yeah, revolving door, by regulatory capture where commissioners can be too cozy with the entities they regulate. Um, so I would say we share your concerns. We would love to have more representation on the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission from a consumer perspective or background as in other states that are also suffering from high utility bills and regulatory capture and have experienced uh, a lot of, yeah, unaffordability issues as well. The other issue I see locally with regard to Centerpoint, uh, formerly a, te well, a Texas company that eventually came to Indiana because they realized that that regulatory commission is basically like the wild, wild west. <laughs> and that was a real good deal for that company to come here as an opportunistic, predatory power company. Secondly, and this is local advertising, I'm sure, when we go to a fireworks display, or you have some sponsorship at an otter's ball game, and Centerpoint wants to applaud and you know make a big deal about we're responsible for this, we did this. Hey, that's our rate money that's that's paying for all those things. People don't get that. People don't get that. Yeah, for sure. We we definitely take that same perspective of yeah, the money that you're paying on your bill should not be funding things like lobbying, funding things like utility doing brand advertising to boost their uh, public image. You know, if you go to the Colts game or the uh, you know Pacers game or something, you see you know or, or a local sports event, you know, you see those billboards. Yeah, those are exactly the types of advertisements that we're looking through, making sure utilities are not baking in the cost of rates, uh, the cost of those types of advertising. However, of course, at the end of the day, the money utility makes is the money they're now spending on things like those advertising. So one way or another, that money is coming from ratepayers. Yeah, I would just, I would just add to that that um, the rating houses and some of the trade magazines grade utility regulatory commissions for their investors. As you can imagine, I think Indiana is a plus, 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 plus. <laughs> but you know, part of the challenge in Indiana, number one, was is the repeal of the Public Utilities Holding Act in 2005 that allowed out-of-state energy companies to purchase local utilities as affiliates. So what we have in Indiana is now Centerpoint, located in Houston, large energy holding company with operations in Texas, Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, elsewhere. The Duke Energy Empire, which now owns Public Service Indiana, formerly Public Service Energy, large 
largest holding company in the country with Duke Energy in Indiana. American Electric Power, owning I&M. AES, owning Indianapolis Power and Light. And NYSource, owning, owning NIPSCO. So we effectively have, with the exception of NYSource, out-of-state energy holding companies whose job it is to deliver earnings and dividends to their shareholders and improve their credit ratings, who exist and live far, far away from their communities and the customers that serve. And we like to just say Indiana is really a cash cow for these out-of-state energy companies. The idea of a locally owned utility that is a good community partner, good corporate citizens, almost no longer exists uh, in the state of Indiana, sadly. Hi, I'm, I'm interested to learn more about municipalization and uh, how we might go about making that legal here. I, I think with municipalization, it would be a Herculean effort. I, I cannot overstate the influence of the big utilities on the entire process. But that's not to say uh, that it can't be done. And how it could be done, I had visions 10 years ago. I was, I don't know why I had this vision. I wasn't naive 10 years ago. But we had, you know, two, um, Two, two mayors that didn't really like their utility companies very much, you know, that were very progressive, even though they were Republicans. Jim Brainerd in, in Carmel, Indiana, who really didn't like Duke. We had Greg Ballard uh, in Indianapolis, and we, <clears throat> I can't forget his name, and the mayor down in Bloomington. So I had this vision of bringing these big mayors together to push for I mean, a little municipal election bill at the state house. So it would have to be it would have to be an extended sort of grassroots effort to bring in mayors, city councils, or others interested in, in, in taking back their utility. And it would have to be a rural, suburban, urban kind of Herculean effort, but I think you could get there if there was serious and deliberate and an extended, committed work on that. It's not as simple. I wish it were. It's not as simple as just getting some rep to introduce a bill. We got that introduced. That's far from the ball game. Far from the ball game. So this would be an extended year sort of campaign that was statewide in nature with an eye towards three, four, five different communities, whether that's Evansville, Bloomington, Carmel, Gary, whatever the case may be, Fort Wayne, whatever. Just a group of cities who, who want to do this and change law. And it would be a fight and the utilities would spend millions, millions on campaigns, and it would require some money, it would require some funding, some dark money, you'd have to play the game. There are folks out there that fund that kind of work, but it would be a, it would be a fight, but it could be done if you had committed communities, committed mayors, committed municipalities, with some financial support behind it to make it happen. Could the utilities add those campaign costs to the next rate increase? <laughs> they could ask. <laughs> Sorry, we do have to be a little bit sensitive of time because when you start cleaning up, but I think we've got a couple more questions. Okay, I imagine that uh, Centerpoint is going to say that the reason they need to spend money is to make our service reliable and resilient. Is someone looking at the cost to tell when they're billing us for a Cadillac when we could get by with a Corolla? I mean, I think that's where the the rate case needs to be, but I'm, I feel powerless to address that issue. Yeah, certainly utilities will frame every dollar they spend as reliability, 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 right? I mean, it's a, we all want reliable service. We all want to turn the lights on with the flip of the switch and have nice, reliable service. So they know that, that that's an effective narrative to tell about any sort of spending. And that is exactly why consumer advocates and other interveners are looking at that kind of thing, to make sure the spending that they're doing on each of these types of equipment, on these power plants, is actually necessary. It's not just gold plating a system, it's not saying it's reliability related when it's really just profit driven. So that's definitely gonna be part of our story, it's gonna be part of our research, part of the evidence we present. Yes. Uh, 
uh, could you give us a little inf information on some of your recent rate cases? I, I recall maybe NIPSCO, you got some pretty good concessions out of that deal. So there's something to work for here. And you give some examples. Well, we recently settled the electric rate cases with both AES Indiana and Indianapolis, uh, Indiana Michigan Power, uh, Fort Wayne Shop, and Monty area. And um, we first have to decide what is what is a settlement in your best interest, because you have to you have to do, you have to weigh the litigation risk behind be, between what you're getting in a settlement. And in those settlements, you get both of those cases, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but the revenue requirement was cut in half. So they got half of what they wanted. The ROE that they requested was reduced significantly. I'm not sure we got real far on some of the cost allocation stuff, <laughs> you know, but, but we tried. But then CAC will also, you know, fixed charges were kept flat, not increased. But then CAC will also ask for other things. In those cases, for both AES, now these, these settlements are not yet approved, but we got in both of those cases agreements by both utilities. They will not disconnect anybody on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, or holidays. Small step, but a step in the right direction. We got them to waive disconnects and reduce reconnect fees significantly down to three dollars for for I and M and similar to IES, I think maybe a little bit more. I and M zero. I zero. Three dollars for right, three dollars for zero on, on reconnection charges. We try to get funding for people like Cape, the community action agencies, to assist low income customers, whether that's through weatherization, direct bill assistance, or other things. We got uh, AES to agree to once a year waiving late charges and late fees, um, reducing deposits for LIHEAP eligible households, low income households to no more than $50. Um, stuff like that. That's, but it's gotta start initially with how big of a rate increase can CAC accept? If we're gonna sign our name to something, what can we sign our name to? <laughs> you know, with this case, I, I, it's hard for, at least as executive director, for me to imagine anything that we would negotiate that what sort of rate increase is okay for center point. But it depends on the details. And this is where litigation risk comes into play. We are not going to appeal and win a settlement between center point and the state of Indiana. That's not going to happen. That would be an enormous waste of CAC's resources and time. So we just have to decide, do we get in there, try to join that settlement discussion and get a few crumbs from that loaf of bread, or is that just too much for us to stomach? Center Point South rate case, we're not signing that thing. Center Point North, sure, get a, get a, get a few things in there. So um, it comes out of that. What what kind of rate increase can CAC stomach? And if we do, if we can take that rate increase, what else do we need? sort of to make us feel okay about that. We just have to feel okay at the end of the day that this was the right thing to do for customers and this was better than our best day before the commission. You know, and I don't know if the settlement is even possible in this case, I have no idea, you know, so. Thank you, Kelly, this is a PSA. I, I am not employed by this organization, CAC, but if you would go to their website and take a look, there's an opportunity to support them financially. Um, if you, and I want to echo what Christopher said, this is mind-blowing. The analysis, the work, the advocacy, it deserves our support. It deserves our financial support. And I'd rather give them some money than center for it. <laughs> so please. <laughs> Uh, Thank you for that, by the way. Thank you. Last thing, I knew you wouldn't do it. Exactly. Right? <laughs> uh, last thing, you all saw on the slideshow when they showed the room, uh, the library up in uh, Indianapolis, half empty. Yeah, yeah. And it's easy to get discouraged. Of course it's easy to get discouraged. But 
if we have half of this room show up at two o'clock and half of this room show up at six o'clock, we're, we're not really showing that this is the urgent case that it actually is. What we need is twice as many in this room showing up at two o'clock and three times as many in this room showing up at six because that is gonna make a difference. Politicians, ask them, they're here. They respond when lots and lots of people tell them that there's an urgent problem. So that's the one thing that, God love the Evansville City Council, I'm, I'm Mount Vernon, but the Evansville City Council at least is putting a good foot forward. And why? Because enough of us showed up that they know it's urgent. So call food banks, call your elected representatives, Call your neighbors, talk to your coworkers, and see how many of those people can come with you when we come and see everybody on the 29th. Small business folks, if you know small business folks, where this is restaurants, local jewelers, craft shops, those sort of things, especially especially restaurants, are being impacted significantly by these costs, and so. Having a couple of small business guys show up, hotel franchise managers, those type of folks, hey, show up and speak out. That, that diversity of voices and sectors uh, is incredibly important. The critical piece pricing program that's part of the request, as well as the Green Power Rider and the tax adjustment, can you talk to any of those? Yes, yeah, so the, the Green Power uh, Pricing Program is a option for large industrial customers to be able to buy clean renewable energy for their businesses a lot of them have sustainability goals so that would be a new program center point is offering for those folks so they can uh, meet those needs uh, so that would not be a residential program um, there's the critical peak pricing uh, program that is a uh, a potential new option for residential customers that center point is considering um, it would be totally voluntary but you could sign up for this rate that would have a lower variable charge for most hours of the day but then during the, the peak hours of the grid when the grid is the most stressed and power is really expensive the charge would be much much more expensive so it would create kind of a financial incentive if you're able to kind of shift around when you use appliances or certain really energy intensive things that could be a good potential program to consider um, it would Center Point is talking about making it just kind of a, a pilot program, limiting the participation to only several hundred customers. So we're going to be filing testimony on the, those types of programs to make sure customers can benefit from them. Um, and then the, the tax adjustment rider, I think, was a question. Uh, I will have to refresh my memory. It's been a little bit since I dug into the details there, but I believe that was a rider Center Point is proposing to pass through tax changes that happen, either good or bad. Um, to reflect those directly on the customer bills. So if their taxes go up, your bills go up. If their taxes go down, they pass through the savings to customers. So I, we often have, we often struggle with utilities proposing new riders, new trackers that insulate their business risk. To just, if they're a business, you know, there's some risk and utilities shouldn't be immune from every single risk and pass all the risk on to their customers. So that's gonna be an example of one of those rider proposals that we're going to take a very critical, careful look at to make sure it's not just eliminating risk for center point while shoving all that risk onto consumers. I wanted to thank our interpreter. We made a decision to see this week start being inclusive and have interpretation services, and I apologize. Do you need a break? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, but thank you. And I was like, oh goodness. It's the first time we've done this, but we thought it was important and we're gonna do this moving forward, so. Real quick, is there any reliability data on center point versus vector? Better, worse? I mean, that data would exist in terms of what they file at the commission. We have not compared it, so it's worth, that's something worth taking a look at. You know, there's boards that was with Vectron that we actually had local people from Evansville on the board. Our rates weren't the best, but we were way more protected then than we are now. Um, 
I just I know that from personal because I had a family member that was on it for a long time. And when they got when they went out, we don't have anybody on that board. I think in Evansville. Right. No, I I knew Neil Ellerbrook and Carl yeah. Chapman and yeah. Ron Christian and those folks. And guess what? Yeah, they had high rates, but at hearings, where was Carl and Neil and Ron Christian sitting in the front row? Yes. They were sitting in the front row, knowing that their captive customers were going to scream and they were angry, but they were there. Yes. Where are Center Point shareholders? Somewhere on the Caymans. <laughs> or was Christy maybe? I'm not, I'm not sure. But. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. That's important yeah. that we can talk to our local officials about, too. I mean, we need their support. You know, I think Evansville's done a, a 360 anyway. Because of some stuff like this, we've changed our representation a little bit and it's time for us to take advantage of that and try to spread it up the ladder because that's where it's going to change honestly you guys I don't know how else to say it but unless we can get a governor and some people representing other counties besides ourselves change isn't going to happen that easy and luckily we have these people at least to try to hold them down a little bit and uh, anyway I just it's not a good thing but it is what it is Okay, we've got... Well, for what it's worth, I talked to then-Representative Mike Braun moments before his vote on 309, mm -hmm. and he was one of the few that gave a floor speech, and just for what it's worth, he voted yes. So. <laughs> um, I guess my question would be, with this rate increase that they're looking for, is there a chance that they won't get anything at all, or is it they are going to get something out of it at the end? Yeah, there's a lot of what are pre-approved projects in here where the commission has already approved these projects. You're already paying some of this stuff through a tracker that's just going to move into base rate. So there is a certain amount of it that is pre-approved. The rest of it is not necessarily pre-approved and how the commission decides to treat it in terms of amortization, depreciation, that sort of thing could change. But again, the commission is also, by statute, in total control so they can they can reject you know deem something not to be recovered by by center point yes and they can make upward and downward adjustments so yeah i just want to emphasize it's not futile it's not a futile effort at all to come out to speak and to challenge this stuff because things like the roe the return on equity that profit margin that is a great example where a small change in a percentage has a huge impact on your bills. Just reducing that ROE from that 10.4% down to something more reasonable, like 9%. Three. 3%. <laughs> reducing that can, can significantly cut that rate increase. I mean, in other cases where I've already crunched the numbers, it's it can cut the proposed increase by a third. You know, just that ROE thing. And that ROE is definitely within the bounds of the commission's control. They definitely have the authority to do it doesn't matter what they've done in the past. Um, that's just a great example of how nothing is fixed yet and how um, they do have a lot of authority to make changes that can limit the bill impact. Do you have any final questions? I do not want to upset the library. They've been very kind to us today. OK, I will say we love this. We are so grateful that you came today and asked so many awesome questions. We would love you to ask more questions if they come to mind. So here's our website. There's a email us on our website, staff at sidac.org. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Any channel you can reach us, carrier pigeon perhaps, we will answer. Just know that we are a fairly small staff, so give us a little bit of time. But um, also wanted to give a shout out to you. I forgot to say this in the beginning, but um, since we've gotten to know some of you since bills have been so high, uh, I know I've been very inspired. And I've been very, I still admire your persistence. So I think one thing that keeps me going throughout the challenges of what we're dealing with at the Regulatory Commission and at the State House and all across the board uh, is that you all care about each other and that comes through time and time again. And I really hope that that comes through on the 29th because that's the what we need to make things better for folks. So don't be shy, please reach out to us. We appreciate you. And we might have to do this again, guys. This was a blast. Thank you.